Hello, I'm Susan Nash, glad to be here. And I'm delighted today to have a guest, Stephen Downs. He's a researcher at the Canadian Research Council. And he's been there for more than 20 years doing all sorts of things that have to do with online education and more. And, and he's it, with a degree in philosophy, he definitely has a very interesting take on things like connectivism and how people learn. So I thought we'd have a chance to, to sort of delve into that. So welcome, Stephen. Hi, Susan. Thanks for having me. So do uh, you want to tell us a little bit about what you do? Well, uh, my official title is researcher, but uh, with Canada's National Research Council, it's a pretty open-ended job. So I do some programming, some writing, or right in the middle now of writing a paper, which I wish I would finish. Um, I do some consulting for companies. I do evaluation of funding proposals for government funding bodies. Uh, what else do I do? I give talks, I write opinion pieces, which are not the same as academic writing, uh, work on projects, developing technology. We've got one project we're on uh, is developing a virtual reality simulator for firefighter training. Uh, another one I did with uh, uh, National Defense was on uh, data literacy, and I published a big report on that. That's the sort of stuff that I do. It's, it's quite a mishmash, but I'm having a blast. <laughs> I like that. Well, I, one of, among all the things that you've done, you, you invented MOOCs along the way, and they've really taken off. They have taken off, and uh, you, know, you look out there in the literature, they're 50-50 on whether what we invented was a MOOC or not. Uh, you know, a lot of people still give credit to the Stanford AI course, which came three years after us, but they're Stanford, so you know they're going to get credit. Um, but uh, yeah, they have taken off, and not just the the formal X MOOC sort of course in a box kind of thing that they did at Stanford and MIT, but also MOOCs based more on the connectivist model that George Siemens and I developed, which are based around uh, uh, communication, interaction, sharing of resources, coming up with new ideas and not based on a set curriculum and certainly not based on learning outcomes. Oh, that's super interesting. So um, speaking of connectivism, I really would like to, to hear your thoughts on connectivism and then following up on that, the idea that learning is not based on learning outcomes necessarily. <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd throw that in there just <laughs> Especially, you know, uh, I imagine a lot of your viewers are coming from a, a corporate or an association learning perspective and it's hard to comprehend learning without learning outcomes but um, <laughs> you know connectivism uh, you know george had his formulation of it and i have mine and they're very similar obviously but they're not identical but basically we agreed on the idea that knowledge is the organization or the set of connections between entities where a connection means that a change a change of state in one entity can result in a change of state in another entity and we use the word entity deliberately as something that's pretty vague because uh, Anything can be an entity as long as it's connected with other entities. So human neural cells are entities and they're connected with each other and they send signals back and forth. Uh, people are entities and they send messages back and forth. Crickets, if you read Duncan J. Walks, are entities and they send messages back and forth and synchronize their chirping in the night. Um, and so on that model learning, is the creation or the modification of these connections. What is it to learn? It's to create connections or to strengthen connections or weaken connections. And there are various theories about just how that happens. Now, George was much more focused on the idea that these connective networks can go from a person to out there in society. 
So you can think of a person's outboard brain. I think it's Clay Shirky who uses that expression. You know, so the, the network of knowledge in the community is part and parcel of the network that we have in our head. My focus has always been on how do these connections form? What is it that makes them form? How, you know, what are uh, the ways in which we strengthen them? or weaken them. And so I'm able to draw a lot, and I draw much more, I think, than George does, on the uh, science uh, of connectionism, which is a different word, notice, from computer science. Connectionism is the theory that is the basis for what is now broadly understood as artificial intelligence. Uh, you're reading or hearing about things like uh, GPT-3 or, uh, oh, what was the name of that one? Uh, it's not Wally, it's Dolly, uh, D-A-L-L-E. Uh, these are very large neural networks that are now doing things like creating articles in newspapers mm -hmm. or uh, creating new artworks. It was a project, you know. Oh, right, right. Do not exist. So these are neural networks. And they learn by forming connections, just as we talked about in connectivism. And uh, what distinguishes one from another of these neural networks, well, first of all, is the experience that they have, that is the data that we feed them. And secondly, the quote unquote learning theory, which is to say the mechanism that the neural network system in question uses to train the network on this data uh, and I use the word train deliberately because that's the words that they use uh, by uh, you know, different mechanisms, uh, you know, uh, back propagation, for example, uh, or you know, competitive pools. Um, there's a whole range of these different types of models. So, connect connectivism is we take all of that, we say. You know, human brains, now they're human brains. We know they're human brains and they're not computers. So there are gonna be differences, but many of the mechanisms are similar, if not the same. Now, there are many different mechanisms in computers than there are in human neurons. We understand that. So the precise learning theory that a human uses is gonna be a bit different. Also, we have way more data than any computer has which makes a big difference. And, and our, our internal neural networks are much larger. So there are differences. Still, we can draw conclusions from that. Um, you know, for example, just like you, you can't just feed a sentence into a neural network or to a network of crickets for that matter and have the uh, neural network remember it similarly, with humans, you know, you can't just say Paris is the capital of France and that human will remember that for all time. That's not how it works. And in fact, the general mechanism of presenting and transmitting information to a person uh, isn't how neural networks learn. It isn't how networks in general learn and it isn't how humans learn. Uh, humans learn through practice, through reflection, through more experiences, through doing things in the world, uh, those sorts of things. And, and so, and again, this is where George and I converge again, is in our discussion of these methods, many of which are consistent with modern constructivist methods. You know, uh, there, there were reasons why constructivism was successful, even if I think on a theoretical basis it was wrong, many of the mechanisms work quite well. I'm babbling, so tell me. No, I really like that. And I like that connection between um, connectivism and, and constructionism and thinking Albert Bandura, et cetera, that, um, that the whole idea is that there's like emulatory learning, we learn from each other, but, mm -hmm. but at the fundamental level, it's on a, about a connection. Now, yeah. the connection and con connectivity is interesting because with it open like that, it can be a connection to prior learning. It could be connection to experience, um, connection to what somebody else is doing. But yeah. 
one could say the richness of the connections is what kind of lets the deeper learning take place. Well, that's a good point. Um, I would probably phrase it a bit different than the richness of the connection because so much depends on, on how we're defining richness, right? Oh, right. Um, in, in general, um, more data is better. Uh, you know, so a 4K image is going to help us learn better than a 512K or five, a small image. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, having the experience of all of the senses is going to help us learn better than having the experience of just one sense. Now, there are arguments about whether there are cases where you can have too much in experience, information overload, things like that. Those are relevant points. There's probably a sweet spot um, as well. There are arguments about the nature of the experience. Uh, which is where your idea of richness comes in, because if I had a 4K image of nothing but blue, I'm not learning very much from that. Um, you know, I need diversity in my images. Uh, I need change in my images. Um, and then, of course, there's the receptivity uh, mm -hmm. that adds to the richness of an experience. You talk about prior knowledge, but I, I would probably phrase that maybe a bit misleadingly as prior experience or even you know just our, our deeper neural net mm -hmm. um you know, yeah uh, so you know we have our conscious experiences which are our sensations uh but the connections keep going deeper and deeper uh beyond our conscious awareness at least I assume for most people, it seems to be the case for me anyways, and I think for other people, sometimes they reflect back, uh, you know, as thoughts or deja vu or memories or whatever. Um, but the thing is that anytime we experience something, there's this dance going on between what we're experiencing and what our previous neural state is. And uh, you know, the more similar what we're experiencing is to what's already in our, our neural state, the more it's gonna conjure up perceptions, the more it's gonna relate to other thoughts, bring up other ideas, et cetera. On the other hand, if they're completely different, um, we're, we're gonna have a tough time processing that. Uh, processing is the wrong word, but you know what I mean. Well, I just love that because I also think that, that the way that we approach and access the deeper neural nets has a lot to do with the, the nature of the engagement and the quality of, of getting us engaged so that we are um, like optimally receptive. Yeah, um, I don't think a whole lot about, I mean, I, I may just, just in terms of, you know, the, the generic learning technology discussion, I'm a bit of an engagement skeptic um, in the <laughs> sense, I know, who is an engagement skeptic? Um, in the sense that uh, the requirement for engagement really is code for saying something like getting people to do something that they don't want to do. <laughs> um, you know. Right? You know, I mean, if they're already interested in it, they don't need engagement. If they already want to do it, they don't need engagement. That's a good point. Yeah. So, um, you know, there are, you know, the tricks that that are used sometimes by learning desires you know the whole gain attention kind of thing you know and things right. like that um i'm not you know I, i'm sort of i have a mixed feeling about those you know do they fall in, under the heading of learning design or propaganda design not sure <laughs> um you know but but nonetheless no matter what you do if the person isn't interested i gotta stop moving around so much if the person isn't interested these tricks aren't going to work you know threats might work 
a lot of learning design is based <laughs> on threats, but uh, but you know we we wouldn't say well yeah just because threats work that doesn't make it good learning design. So there's a lot more going on here. Well, and you point to the, like I mean this is one thing I've seen over the last I don't know 10, 15 years as as a, a kind of a rigidification of the of the course design and the yeah. course design document and all the things you must put in there and. And to be honest, I've, I've gotten in and out of like being either really, really bored by it or mm -hmm. uh, perversely interested to see if I could like disrupt it a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's become pretty static. Um, you know, I, I, again, we mentioned I work for the government. Um, so they inflict learning on us. <laughs> and so I actually get quite a bit of exposure through um, a corporate LMS to corporate training and oh my goodness. Um, so mostly what I've learned is that I can get through it without actually learning anything uh, pretty rapidly. Um, <laughs> helps knowing how they're designed. Um, <laughs> You know, and you know, yeah, there is a structure, but I don't think, I mean, there's there's two things here that are happening, right? The, the one thing is, I don't think that they're actually getting people to learn the things that people want them to learn. And Donald Clark goes on about this, about diversity and equity training and things like that. He says, yeah, you, you roll out this training and nothing changes. And he's probably right about that. Um, not that diversity and equity and inclusion are bad things. They're great things. And I certainly encourage, you, I, I encourage them, mm -hmm. but I probably wouldn't foster them in my organization by rolling out a training curriculum. Um, and that's the second thing, this idea of learning as being defined by mastery of or acceptance of or internalization of a certain body of knowledge. Um, part of, a big part of what George and I both agreed on is that this is probably a really bad definition of learning. And that, you know, and in a corporate environment, they have not left that definition of learning. Um, but in, in the work, especially the work that I've done since, um, but also George to some degree, uh, learning is much more about personal capacity, personal development, uh, being able to, uh, navigate in an environment, especially a complex environment, adapt, change, uh, see what's new when something new comes up. Um, you know, I talk about, and, and again, this goes back to, you know, learning is the actual formation of connections. Learning is not a process of assimilating information. It's a process of growth. Uh, it's a process of actually becoming the person who is a whatever, right? So, you know, becoming a physicist, uh, an example I've used a lot, uh, you know, isn't remembering a whole bunch about physics. Uh, becoming a physicist is seeing the world the way a physicist does, recognizing uh, based on, you know, compatibility of one's neural network with others who are also in the same discipline, recognizing certain problems as physics problems, recognizing certain types of evidence as evidence that would address physics problems. There's a whole load of jargon, the terminology. Um, you know, a physics, a physicist sees the world, literally sees the world differently from a chemist, differently from a baseball player, uh, which is uh, interesting because a baseball player and a physicist are fundamentally doing the same thing yeah. uh, in important ways. Uh, <laughs> but the whole concept that they have approaching this is different. Mm -hmm. uh, what counts as a problem, etc. So, you know, how do you bring in uh, a method structure and vocabulary of 
learning objects, presentation of information, test for recall, all of those sorts of things into an understanding of learning where learning is actually becoming like other members of the profession. Right, I just really like that. And, you know, a lot of the things that I get involved with have to do with, with um, exactly what you're talking about, the learning through the, the ways that you make connections and the additional connections that are made. And in terms of changing and transforming ourselves, um, I work with uh, geologists and right in the last couple of years, we've really been focused on expanding, going, getting into things like geothermal energy. And so the question is, okay, what are the skill sets that people have through with the, the curriculum that they maybe had or the experiences they had? How are those transferable to the types of things that you would need for um, for geothermal, not just volcanic geothermal, but sedimentary, you know, on and on. Yeah. And it becomes really interesting. And you can see people like, oh, they, they, they spark of like, yes, I see the connections. <laughs> yeah. And, and they're going to see the connections and these skills are going to be transferable. But I think, you know, something to be tested empirically. Everything about connectivism and uh, but what I say is and ought to be tested empirically, um, but not by, <laughs> uh, because it takes way too much time. Um, but, you know, when, you know, when you're going from say petroleum geology to geothermal, mm -hmm. a lot of what you know, a lot of the jargon, a lot of the a lot of what you made, what made you a petroleum geologist is gonna carry over. Yeah. Uh, it'd be, almost impossible to actually enumerate that. In fact, I think it would be a failed effort. Um, yeah. And I don't think that it can be carried over until the person actually has experiences in uh, the profession of, I don't know what they are, geothermists? Uh, geothermal engineers. Yeah. Um, right. Um, you know, until they actually have some exposure and experience in geothermal engineering, it's only then that they can begin to see, oh yeah, here's the connection, here's the connection, because again, it comes down to, you know, has to match up with actual experiences that they have. Exactly, exactly. And one of the most interesting um, projects I've been looking at recently, or there are a couple of them, they have to do with converting abandoned oil wells into geothermal. Well, uh -huh. I mean, okay, they sound great until <laughs> you really do have to have people who are in in the area of like uh, borehole integrity, et cetera. Otherwise, horrible yeah. things will happen. <laughs> yeah. I could, I can only imagine what could happen. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and literally, I can only imagine. <laughs> um, although I did have some brief exposure to the uh, geology community, my, one of my first jobs was working for a company called Geophysical Services Incorporated. Oh, nice. Uh, GSI, uh, which nice. was, I think it still is a division of Texas Instruments uh, that was in Calgary. So yeah, we, we did a lot of uh, geophysical data processing and I learned all about the state of the art of geophysical data processing. Now this was fake. 1980. <laughs> so I imagine things have changed. Um, but yeah, so it's, it was uh, an interesting experience. So oh, I almost nice. became one of those. Nice, nice. Yeah, well, things have changed. I mean, mainly in, in the volumes and the, uh, the data and the size of the computers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, computers that I worked on there are called TIMAP, Texas Instruments Multiple Application Processors. And they were larger than a desk. And, oh, and wow. We, yeah, and uh, we didn't have screens. Um, you, mm -hmm. you would program them with card punches, obviously. Yes. <laughs> and the output, uh, we had uh, thermal paper. And it would print on thermal paper and we get rolls of the output. Or we had the line printer for batch output too. 
Oh yeah, yeah. The, I remember those, but like in the early, early days. So you still have, and then it, it would come out and be on this green and white lined paper. Yeah, yeah. That was the batch printing paper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We that those are interesting early days. Of like yeah. Anyway, yeah. Well, this is super interesting, and and um, it, I would do you have any um. I, well, I'll put it in the show notes some links mm -hmm. to some of the things that, that people can sign up for that you might describe some of the things that, that you make available. Sure. Um, we'll have, okay, everything's on my website, uh, downs.ca, and that's D O W N E S dot C A for Canada. Um, the thing to watch for is my daily newsletter called OL Daily, Online Learning Daily. Uh, so titled because I have no imagination. Um, also, I still do MOOCs. Um, and uh, I am planning a MOOC this fall. It'll be the second running of this MOOC um, called Ethics, Analytics, and the Duty of Care. And you can find all of the content in that for that already at ethics.mooc.ca. Um, and I did some recent work on data literacy, and uh, you can find that at data.mooc.ca. Cool. Well, this is really great. And I just want to um, tell you again how much I appreciate your being on the, on the show and, and like to invite you back to this and also e-learner chat that um, I've been involved in. Um, it's it's a slight. It's in a little hiatus because Rick Zanotti moved from California to Idaho, so I don't think he said oh, yeah. it's office yet at studio. Yeah. <laughs> but but it, when we get going, that will be great. And just um, want to tell you, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Oh, pleasure is all mine, and I'm always happy to have a conversation. This this is all interesting stuff to me. I could talk about it forever. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you. And well, um, I'll put up all the show notes, show notes and we'll be in touch. Okay. Nice to talk with you. <laughs> thank you.